most I'm sorry. In any case, thank you for joining us this evening. All of us, because it's not just me. I might be the only one here speaking into a, a phone today or a camera, however you want to put it. But we are joining together with the whole body of Christ who have come together to worship him, to praise him, to lift him up, to recognize that the spirit within us is powerful even when we're so segregated. You know what? The church is often insulted because we're so separated or so segregated or so um, separated in any case, you know, with many denominations and other things. I'm very proud to be a Southern Baptist because I believe Southern Baptists interpret Scripture correctly. <laughs> but it's interesting now because we're more separated than we could ever possibly be because we're all at our own residences. And it doesn't change the fact that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. There's a lot of powers in the world, but there's only one power that stands above them all that controls it all, that nothing can turn against, and that is the power which we serve. The power that is found only in God that brings us together, hopefully this evening, hopefully you're with me in consideration of our God and of our Christ. As we begin this service together, please join me in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, my God, I just want to take this moment to extol your majesty. You are great above all things. You are mighty, Lord, and you are mighty for us. Lord, I can't even begin to praise your name to the heights of which it deserves. So, Lord, I offer you this humble prayer in recognition that you are great, in recognition that you are good, in recognition that you are altogether loving, and in recognition that you are God. It was you who sent your son Jesus to die for us. And Lord, we ask all these things that we do ask in your son's name, because we know he provided the hope for us. Lord, your plan was majestic. It's beyond human understanding, Lord. But it all works so perfectly, and it makes perfect sense. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that what our minds couldn't understand you brought about for us. And Lord, you have blessed us with little pieces to grow us spiritually, Lord. Not giving us more than we can handle, Lord, but not keeping from us what is necessary. So Lord, I thank you for all the many blessings, the spiritual blessings, the physical blessings, the blessings in which we find joy every day. And Lord, there's so much to be thankful for. And we do thank you. Thank you now for this time we have together. Please bless it and watch over us. It's in your holy and precious name I pray. Amen. <laughs> Wednesday night is a wonderful time to be able to come together. You get a reminder of the things of God in the middle of the week. Um, I don't know if you are the type to normally attend on a Wednesday. I know it's not as many as often are the case. But I want to encourage you. Come for your own sake. I've had many people tell me they need a refresher in the middle of the week to continue them on in faith through that week. Not that they would lose faith, but that they need the encouragement. Perhaps you too need that encouragement. And as services start to return, I want to encourage you, if you are watching this service, to make it a habit to come back to our church. Oh, you haven't heard yet. I presume most of you have, but <laughs> I can play it off. If you haven't heard... We're planning to return to church soon. Our first service will be May 3rd. Uh, the governor has allowed for worship, places of worship to reopen with very strict social distancing guidelines. You can see all the specifics of it online, but we're going to be staying away from each other. We're going to be wearing masks for a little while. And we're going to be safe. But at the same time, we're going to be able to worship together again. And I know many of you have been looking forward to that, and I'm very much looking forward to that. If you're with us this evening and you have any prayer requests or any prayer needs, uh, please mark it in a comment and we'll be sure to pray for that. And if you have any more questions about our reopening, go ahead and check it out on our Facebook link and also on our website. You'll see it right there. 
Today's service today is coming directly from 1 John chapter 4. You know, I don't preach often on the same passages of Scripture. Uh, I recognize today this is a passage I preached, uh, one of the earliest sermons I did at this church in 2016. However, I didn't use that sermon in reference. Uh, I wonder if it's similar. I'll have to look afterwards. Uh, but... Uh, the, first, the passage 1 John 4, 1 through 6, was one of the first passages I preached at this church. It was a very different theme and a very different idea, but uh, today we look at it uh, for today, with today in mind. Today's sermon is entitled, Living a Gospel Life, and it comes from the first six verses in 1 John chapter 4. If you're able, you can stand for the reading of God's Word. If not, that's okay. Please listen along, and it'll... It'll be on the screen for us here in just one moment. Living a Gospel Life, 1 John 4. The Word of God says this. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world, and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. I'm going to ask a very simple question to start our sermon today. What does it mean to live a great life? And you know what? If you ask any number of people, they might give any number of different answers. As a matter of fact, I'm sure people would define that. Very different ways. But I want to encourage you, the Word of God says in Psalm 20, verse 7, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. You see, there might be different measurements by, why peop by how people measure success. Some people measure success in treasures, in trophies. Some in strength and skill. Maybe people use other measures. Of course they do. And you know what? Christians can have these things. They can have trophies. They can have treasures. They can have strength. They can have skill. But we should not place our trust in these things because we realize how hollow and fleeting they can be. You know, I've never lost a loved one to dementia. So I'm only speaking secondhand from people I've heard from. And I've known a number but they say you lose a person twice. First, when they stop recognizing you, and then finally when they pass on. I understand this to be something that is very hard and very sad in this life. First, I want to highlight the compassion of the caregiver. I know at times these people feel like maybe even they're trapped, but I also know they are often moved by the deepest of compassion and love. You know, there was a time in all our lives when we were cared for, where we had basically no means to care for ourselves. They speak of this reversing later in life. But in some ways, more drastic than others. A mother cares for a baby, knowing that the child will likely grow. But what if a child is not well? It is a deep kind of love that cares for a child that you might not be able to keep long or that may never stop being a child. I've not been placed in such situations, but I can duly recognize the kind of love that strives to help those who in many ways cannot help themselves. I see this in Christ's love, and I think most people recognize it as a greater love. Christ himself said, greater love hath no man than this, that he die for a friend. The greatest love, according to the word of God, is sacrificial love. And Christians are encouraged to live sacrificial lives. 
That is to say, for a Christian, both living and dying is a calling to love. Because we are called to live for a cause, and, and hopefully we might die for a cause also. At least it's better to die for a cause than die for nothing. I'm not saying many of us will be called to make that sacrifice. I hope that we do not have to. But I also hope that we could. I began reading a book. Um, I am in, and I've been reading for a little while now. I'm not necessarily the fastest reader. I've just been reading a few chapters at night. It highlights Christians who have given up their livelihoods and even their lives for the cause of Christ or via persecution from non-believers. And I recognize the book is only a small fraction, a very small fraction of the Christian martyrs in the world today. As a matter of fact, the book says that in the very first chapter. It says, this is but a peek to help you understand what's really going on. Why are they willing to go through all this? Well, of course, there's something powerful about our Lord Jesus Christ. Serving him is, is no small matter whatsoever. So if you give your life to Jesus, hopefully you've made a sure proclamation. Hopefully you, you're saying you're willing to do some things that maybe other people wouldn't see as profitable. But they're willing to do this because of great love. For the Christian, this is said in, in a very famous love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. It says, only things done for love are worthwhile. That's my own personal paraphrase, but the point is simple enough. While some things done for other, other motivations are, are not necessarily bad, but they are definitely weaker and often spiritually worthless. That's exactly what 1 Corinthians says. It says if you're not doing motivations, if you're not doing things motivated by love, you are a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. That it's worthless without love. So I think I could say quite reasonably that to have a greater life, you have to start with love, and I think that's appropriate, but I think that's Almost too straightforward. So then I ask that question again. How do you have a great life? Well, according to the passage we're looking at, the first is simple enough. Now, I change it to derail. I also like disrail, and you'll see it change a few times. I know disrail is not really a word, but I like the connotation behind it. Um, so I messed it up and have it in my notes one way, and then I have it in the PowerPoint in another way, and then the PowerPoint switches. Because um, that's life once in a while. But the first point I want you to get is not to be disrailed or not to be derailed. The passage says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. What's the greater lie? An unbelievable one or a believable one? This might seem simple enough. Most people... Don't fall for the unbelievable lies. But it's amazing how many do still fall for them. So take this as a warning, Christians, not to fall away to obvious mistruth. It is often the believable lies that disrail good ministry work, good Christians. But even a Christian can just stop paying attention and be derailed by things that are obviously untrue. That's why Christians need to be diligent. That is why we all need to be diligent in the word. And that's why we need each other. You know, a good friend might just be a good friend because they will warn you if you're making mistakes. You know, I'd rather have someone point out that there's broccoli in my teeth or, or something worse than that than just let it be. A good friend will offer even embarrassing counsel if it's for your benefit. Now, if the hearer will not listen, perhaps you've warned enough. But we ought to not let a brother fall without warning. And we should hope the same from others because we need each other. Lies are not as easy to see as we like to think it is. And the thing about lies is they seem more believable when more people say them. 
They seem more believable when people we trust say them, and they seem more believable when you hear them over and over and over again. That is how a lie becomes something in your life. It doesn't normally just completely derail you immediately. It plants a seed and it grows slowly. And before you know it, you've become a different person. How do you stop weeds from growing? Well, you can wait till the weeds grow and then you can tear it out by the root. But that's a lot more troublesome. That's a lot more violent. As a matter of fact, many weeds have weaker stems. So when you pull at them, the roots stay attached but the plant pulls off, and then the weed grows back. So to remove a weed, it's, it's much harder. But if you take precaution, you can keep that weed from ever taking root. I don't know if I would call the Bible weed killer, but I know it can stop many things from taking root in your life. And in, it will instead let what is beautiful flourish. Beware, though, lies are by definition deceptive. I don't quote this man often, but if I'm speaking of someone who knows how to lie, I guess I would consider him an expert. Adolf Hitler directly killed millions or ordered the deaths of millions. And then through war, he was indirectly involved in somewhere between 50 million to 60 million, if not more, people who died because of him. He spoke in his terrible book about what he called the big lie. That is what you need to do to deceive people, he said. Lie so big that it's hard to refute. He went on to say he didn't want the Jews to just die. He wanted them to die in agony. For this reason, he prolonged their suffering. And it's also for this reason we would be able to save many. If he had just immediately executed people, it would have been impossible to liberate so many. The world tells some big whoppers often. And people fall for them every day. Because those big whoppers are often so complex, or they center around our own pride. You ever heard of the uh, Gelman amnesia effect? Basically what it's saying is if you're an expert in something, it's really easy to tell if someone is, is lying to you in your field of expertise. And a matter of fact, if you're an expert in something, it's really easy to recognize all the lies within your field of expertise. But then you go to a field where you, you're not an expert, and you just believe all the experts, as if their field does not have all the lies your field does. Basically, it's saying if you're well-versed in, in something, it's really easy to pinpoint a lie, but we forget how many lies there are when listening to something we don't know well. For instance, I consider myself rather well-versed in Scripture. Many times people come up to me with things, and I can tell them with pretty good assurance whether or not it is in Scripture. I imagine most people couldn't do that. But I'm in Scripture daily and constantly. My life revolves around it. So I know how many things I, I see in the world which are blatant lies on the face according to the Word of God. Many people who speak on Bible and God, their opinions are no more valuable than the time it takes to hear it. But then we go to the things we don't know, and we lose that skepticism. For instance, if someone tells, tells me things about cars, I, I might defer to experts. But I have no means by which I could judge those expert opinions. Their opinions might not really be that valuable. I just can't judge it. For instance, a lot of people defer to scientists for climate knowledge. And I'm not speaking one way or another on climate knowledge. I know today is Earth Day. But I do notice that not all scientists agree. So most people agree with the ones that they like that just fortifies their own opinions on the matter. That is what we would call a big lie. It's just so invasive that it's hard to refute. And then there's another, which Socrates called the noble lie. Which is essentially, if you want to lie to someone, you tell them something they want to hear, something they want to believe, and it becomes much more believable for them. 
just as many today live in echo chambers. The noble line speaks sweet nothings in your ears and leads you to a derailed life. I'm actually blessed to be a Christian and to be looking at our passage today because I can say, looking at our passage right here, this is something that sets Christianity apart. We tell you to test the spirits. I don't know many other religious and belief structures that encourage this. Most of them encourage some kind of mental fortress where you hide yourself from ideas that, that disparage your core belief systems. Even me and myself, I might protect the weak from things that I think would derail them. But we are actually called to test those spirits to see if they're all from God. Christians, don't let lies about Christ keep you from the heart of Christ. How to live a greater life. Don't be disrailed. Don't be derailed. And keep Christ as authority. Keep Christ as the central authority in your life. Keep Christ as the authority of what is and is not what is right. Listen to this. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. Do you know where the concept of an inch comes from? Now, most of you today would probably know that it's 12 inches to a foot. But measurements have changed many, many times throughout the century. As a matter of fact, the idea of the inch and the idea of the foot goes all the way back to the Romans. And although the precise length of a foot varied anywhere from 12 to 16 inches over the centuries, there were many places that, that was even different than that. The Welsh in, in ancient Celtic society had a nine inch foot. The city dwelling Romans came closest today to what we would call the modern foot. Their foot was 11.64 inches. And then in other parts of Rome, their foot was 13.15 inches. And why would that be? Well, because some of them counted a foot by Emperor Maximilian's foot, which was 11.64 inches. Others counted a foot by Emperor Nero's foot, which was 13.15 inches. In England, the original foot measurement wasn't a foot at all, which is very strange. It was the length of the monarch's arm. In England, I've heard many times that, you know, an inch would be a thumb or, uh, you know, different measurements would be a pinky or a toe. During the reign of Edward I, he actually <laughs> measured an inch by the length of three grains of barley. <laughs> it's, it's so strange. But most of the time, it was the, the imperial system was based on the leaders. I guess that's why it's called the imperial system. So a lot of measurements have been based off of people. Even the metric system was something that someone designed. Now, people might argue that it's a better system because it's based on tens. But what is a meter? What is a centimeter? It is a great tool because you need common measurement for society, but it's something someone made. Someone decided this is a centimeter. Someone decided this is a meter. <clears throat> or vice versa. But Christians... We are called to measure by Christ. We're called to measure the world, not in worldly measures, but by the measure of Christ. Listen to Matthew 7, 2. <clears throat> For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Listen to Hebrews 12, 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. If I might paraphrase the beginning of that verse. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He is the authority. 
And by that, I don't mean all our misconceptions about Jesus. But Jesus as he truly was and is. The way he's presented in Scripture. Actually, that's the point of our passage, because many people were not sure who Christ was. He'd come, he died, he rose again. And there were lots of rumors about Christ. The person and Godhood of Christ needed to be made clear. So it's obvious then, and it's obvious today, there are two spirits at work. The spirit that came from God and Christ. And then the Antichrist. And the Antichrist will always count, contradict the work of Christ. So to avoid the one that is wrong, you need to know the one that is authentic. To avoid the one that is wrong, you must know Christ. You must be in the word and keeping him in front of you, keeping your eyes on Jesus so that you can know when you're face to face with something that is a big, bold lie. And I'll tell you what. I already said I'm, I like to consider myself someone who knows the Bible pretty well. I am absolutely astounded how often people lie about Christ. You must be in the word. You must be keeping him in front of you so that you can recognize the spirit of Christ in the world. And you know, that's better anyway, because you cannot improve on what God has already given you. You cannot improve on what God already has given us. Why stick yourself to something that's lesser when you can stick yourself to the one that is greater? The passage says, you dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. You know, people have tried to do this forever. They try to massage the work of grace in order to change its substance. Be it by being picky in scripture and only choosing certain parts and elevating those parts above other parts. Be it by disregarding godly authority, throwing parts of the Bible out entirely. Be it by disregarding the character and person of Christ. Let me emphasize this again, because there's a lot of people that have a false picture of who Jesus is and was in the world. And they base it off of, not the Bible, but their own perceptions of what they think goodness and godliness is. Well, let me tell you what. The heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? If you base Jesus off yourself, you don't know him. You're only saying you know yourself. And you're not God. You cannot take away from what God has given us and have something greater than what God has given us. You cannot take away from the character of God and have something that's greater than God. And you cannot add anything to God and have something that's greater than God. And this follows through with his word. To dissect his words and think we've had a we have a greater faith. That's foolishness. To dissect his words and think we've created something that is better than the original. Now this isn't always true, but it's true with the word of God. Nothing beats the original. That is why the rule in Christ is, is different than the, the ways rules. Because when we try to do it our own ways, we, we end up flat on our faces in the end. We end up acting foolishly instead of listening to the law of life which has been given to us. And Christ knocks all these worldly systems upside down. That is why the rule in Christ has become less to become more. Christ himself declared, this is uh, Luke 22, 25 through 26, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, the people, and those in authority over them call themselves benefactors, but you should not be like them. That's the Christians. He says, don't be like them. Instead, the greatest among you should be the youngest and the one who leads like the one who serves. Christ said, 
the greatest must become the least. This, of course, speaks about our relationship to one another. This is not a kingdom which is called to abuse, but healing. This is not a community that harbors piousness and pride over each other. The church is meant to be a safe place to meet God. You know, today anymore we hear a lot about quote-unquote safe spaces. The world's idea of a safe place is ridiculous. It's exclusionary. It's a place that the weakest may feel completely unchallenged. It's a place where the most foolish are allowed to live in that foolishness. No, I'd rather be strong than be weak and protected. It isn't safe at all. It's about locking yourself up, never being challenged, and expecting somehow to better oneself. That is not how any of this works. That's not how life works. You need a community to grow. You need a church for meaningful growth. You need challenges in life to overcome, to make something of yourself. Even some of the people of God have been confused by things like this today. They think they're making it on their own. You know, I've yet to see it. I've yet to see meaningful ministry totally separated by the fellowship found from the fellowship found in the body of Christ. I'm not saying everything requires a, a church setting. Certainly there are churches that do anything but good God-honoring work. But isolation, by any means, is not the work of the Spirit. And God wants us to be examples in the world. In order for that mandate to work, the greatest must be the least. We take, for example, from the faith of a child. Christ said, you need to have faith as a child. And we take, for example, John the Baptist, who in meeting Christ said, I must decrease and he must increase. In that way, we elevate Christ then. Because we recognize he is greater. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So I can play like I'm all that. Or I can let him who is in me work through me. You know, I just might try to be great in my own power and my own strength. But my great is not going to amount to much. See, there's always these fighting loyalties question comes down to who do you serve? Listen, listen to verses 5 and 6. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Now, things have gotten a little more confusing lately than I think they used to be. I think most of you would agree with me today. Either something is true or it is false. Either something is right or it is wrong. You could talk about gray areas, and there's room for gray areas, but something cannot be both true and not true at the same time. And people that have different truths, quote unquote, cannot both be right. Now, maybe it's respectful to treat people with a certain amount of respect. That would be the definition of respectful. But it's necessary at times to challenge people's idols, to show people that there is something true in the world upon which they can claim. Because there are so many invasive lives. And there's something greater out there. Something greater than you, greater than me, greater than philosophy, and yes, greater than science. Why? Because God made all the scientific rules that people lift up. He made the earth and all that is in it. God could change the rules at the snap of his finger. But we do not have a God that's a God of confusion, but of order. God is greater than all these things. 
God is greater than coronavirus. God is greater than our fears. God is greater than our greatest hopes. And it's him who wants to work in us. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And you can go through life. You can serve lesser masters. You can serve other things. But if you want to find the true purpose the Lord had planned for your life, don't give your life the things that are lesser than him. If you want to have a great life, you got to serve the great one. You got to serve the King of Kings. You got to serve the Lord of Lords. You got to serve Christ and serve God. And you can do these great things for Him. As a matter of fact, Christ said in John 14, 11 through 13, Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I've been doing. And they will do even greater things than these. That's amazing. Christ wants to do great things in your life. He wants to do great things through you. He wants to show his glory and holiness to a world that is in desperate need of his message, in desperate need of his character, in desperate need of his truth, because they are falling flat on their faces, believing all the lies, and arming themselves a destiny of death and losses and error. Only Christ, only Christ frees us from these shackles. Only Christ saves us from our biggest problems. Only Christ heals the soul. You might be listening to me and saying, Pastor James, you know what? I need this Jesus. I need this healing. I need this hope that he offers. You know what? You might even be a Christian and say that. Not that you're not saved, but that you're dealing in the muck and the mire of the everyday and you've sort of left your first love. Don't leave your first love, brothers and sisters. Cling to Christ. Keep your eyes on him. Focus on him. Let him lead you to greater things, to greener pastures, to the hope that we all so desperately need. And if you're listening and you're not a Christian, Jesus loves you. He died for you. And it wasn't just some man dying on the cross. God incarnate in the flesh died for you and your sins so that you wouldn't have to live the way you're living. He wants to free you. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you can do that today. Not some special magical words, but if you need it in your heart, the word of God says, believe in your, <laughs> believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. The word of God says, put your faith in Jesus. And he accepts you no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. You can do that today. As soon as this is over, kneel down and pray to God. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Ask him to save you. And you need to ask this through the name of the Son. And he dies. It's simple. What are you waiting for? You're still listening and you're a believer and you say, Pastor James, I just need help today. I want to live a great life. I don't want to just dawdle through. I don't want to just waste it. But I want to encourage you, keep your eyes on Jesus. And I'm going to pray just for you and me to do that same thing. Please join me. Dear Lord, my God, I pray, Lord, for everyone listening today, first for the non believer, that you would make them courageous, that you would bring them to a place of brokenness and surrender that they would accept your son Jesus and be saved this very moment. And Lord, for the rest of us, Lord, it can be so easy to take your eyes off, take our eyes off of what is important and not measure things by your son. 
we start thinking about things that tear us down instead of lift us up. But God, we don't want to live that way. So Lord, I pray that you would magnify yourself in our eyes. And Lord, at the same time, that you would make us less as we make you more. That we might surrender more. That we might offer more. That we might get the joy of our salvation that you offer us. And that we might do something great. Lord, bless us as we seek you. We love you. We praise your name. And it's in your Son's holy name, in the name of the Heavenly Father, we ask this. you and I want to assure you if you need anything from me I'm available even before things open up but I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to be together again if you need anything feel free to comment let me know and I look forward to our next meeting God bless you